If you're a local listener, we want to give a quick shout out to a local business we're obsessed with. Mirror Magic Hair Design, located on McLaughlin Boulevard in Oregon City. I always look forward to my next appointment with Andrea at Mirror Magic Hair Design. She's the owner and not only is she incredibly personable and funny, she has poured herself into ensuring that Mirror Magic has nice decor, professional hair products, offers fantastic cuts and color, and ultimately that all of her clients are truly happy. They offer a wide array of services, so check them out. She does incredible work, and without a doubt, the amazing results always make my day. Call to schedule at 503-650-0550. You can also find their contact info in our show notes. Caitlin, this is P and W Haunts and Homicides. Hi, creepy people. I like it when you say it. You do? Oh, <laughs> yeah. sorry. Did you want to say it? You no, can say it. I like it when you say it. <laughs> I think it flows better. <laughs> yeah. Maybe whoever says the last thing, yeah, can say it. Like... Or you know, what I mean. just like how you say creepy oh. people. You make creepy it sound people. happy. <laughs> creepy people. <laughs> <laughs> creepy paper. <laughs> <laughs> creepy paper. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are getting into part two of this episode is currently untitled as we record it, so oh. it's part two of <laughs> um, this fuck nut we're talking about. Yeah, fuck John, nut. I like it. John, John, fuck nut Brandon. John, fuck nut Brandon. Did we just name this fucking thing? I'm writing that down. I don't know if we could put fuck nut in the title, though. Can we not? I feel like we should be able to call For, like, it... posting purposes? Oh, can we do, like, an asterisk or something? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I feel like we can do special characters. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll figure that out, and we'll get back to you guys. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> now, remember, we left off in episode one with John in the wind, which is one of my favorite terms for being on the run. <laughs> in the wind. <laughs> yeah. It, it reminds me of like, uh, fuck, what are, I don't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> that, why does that keep happening to Gone me Gone with the wind? Or? No, I was thinking oh. of something like, it's gone, it's, you guys. I hate that. It's out of my brain. This literally happened earlier. Yeah, I mean that's kind of the story of my life. Do so I can a, I can get it. I need a memory stone to play with or something, a memory crystal <laughs> to help my Do you, brain. We should look really quick. What is uh is there a what crystal is good for memory? I bet you I have it. <laughs> right. <laughs> it found its way to me. It knew. He was like, You need me. Interesting thing about picking like crystals and stones is you're supposed to just hold them and just pick whatever your like intuition tells you. And then you like look up what it's for. And I so I've been doing that. And all of the things are like things that I need in my life, like better sleep and oh shit. What do you have it? <laughs> I might have it. I do. What is it? Um. So here, I'll just give you this. Just rub all up on this. Oh, it's bad just bo- selenite. It's selenite, yeah, or oh. amethyst. Oh, I have that too. Lapis lazuli. L- I don't know if I'm saying that right. Oh, and citrine. Oh, wow, this makes a lot. Oh, I have citrine too. Stop it. Okay, the best gemstones to protect against memory loss: agate, clear quartz, have rose that. quartz. Have that. Citrine. Have that. <laughs> amethyst. <laughs> selenite calcite oh my gosh okay this is so funny yeah it's basically all the ones that i have um fluorite and pyrite oh this is 
fluorite. The one that I've been fondling all day. My little necklace is a rainbow fluorite. Mm. Yeah. So it's not working? Apparently <laughs> it's not working. Maybe you should take it off and charge it on the selenite. It does. It sits yeah. on my selenite every night. Do you? Oh, mm-hmm. you're so good. Yeah, I sent you that picture of yeah. my nightstand with all of the... It's so cute. I have a bunch what of a, like... Um, altar. Like good sleep ones on there and then things for like prophetic dreams which i haven't had any yet so it's fine but it's okay (laughs) i have found that any of the dreams that i've had that have felt prophetic were like not prophetic in a good way (laughs) well um we'll just have to decide how much of this is beneficial to the episode i think it's interesting (laughs) i think so. it doesn't have to do with the murder it doesn't um yeah spoiler alert there is a murder Oh, I didn't even. We well, didn't I even just assume. Yeah, you're like murder, right? Haunts and homicides. <laughs> <Yeah>. I mean, <laughs> usually in a roundabout way, we find a way to get there about the murder. Unfortunately. So, back to John in the wind, gone with the wind, <laughs> fucking around in the wind, wiling out <laughs> in the wind. The wind, the wind. The wind. Yeah. <laughs> Kate was slowly regaining a feeling of control and stability in her life, but was ultimately fearful of what might happen to others that would come into contact with John, unaware of his past littered with violent and fraudulent behavior. So I told you guys last time, there's some money stuff. There's a lot of money stuff. He's a fraudster. He's the worst. Was he even a doctor? (sighs) I mean, kind (laughs) of. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i mean literally nothing about this guy so you remember Teresa? Mm-hmm. which mean, one we could, yeah <laughs> the no, liar really. total goddamn liar um yeah that could have just as easily been john fucknut brandon's nickname so he was just like i'm a learned doctor and that's my degree yes <laughs> my apartment smells of rich mahogany <laughs> I have many leather-bound books. <laughs> yeah. So, Kate was right to be worried, of course. Sadly, not exactly a spoiler. We would have ended the case series already if there wasn't more to this story. Um, so, are you ready for this? Not you, the creepy people. Oh, okay. No, I was like, kidding. do I have to answer? <laughs> I don't want to. I'm taunting you. I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I did, like, the world's longest intentional pause and then (laughs) teased you like a little sister. (laughs) What I'm about to share with you comes directly from a report by the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence dated back to 2008. This section of the report pertains to a good cross-section of dates during which both Kate and... Turi's stories take place. You don't know Turi yet. I'll introduce you to her. Okay. She sounds fucking badass. Okay. Today's episode will focus on Turi now that we have already heard Kate's story. The Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence looked at the issues surrounding domestic violence from just about every angle that I can think of. It's truly exhaustive. So here's a summary of the topics that the report covers. Barriers to safety for victims of color, as well as native and immigrant victims. Availability of community and economic resources. The role of the Department of Social and Health Services. How alcohol and other drugs, or even how physical and mental health may play a role. They also examined civil legal issues, the criminal legal system, and even the juvenile justice system, because as much as we're loath to admit it, these are crimes that affect children in all too many cases. It will shed some light on why the turn of events following Kate's horrific ordeal come as little surprise. Unfortunately, it's all too common for the end of her story to be the start of another nightmare when an abuser successfully evades justice. Mm. Between January 1st, 1997 and June 30th, 2008, 430 people, 
in Washington state were killed by domestic violence abusers. Oh. Their deaths are not unpredictable, isolated events without context or warning. Most of the victims whose murders we discuss in this report reached out for help. They planned with friends, family, and coworkers. They went to therapists, attorneys, and healthcare providers. They called police. They went to court. They worked with domestic violence advocates. They stayed in shelter. They struggled to be mothers and friends and students and employees and volunteers and to contribute to their communities in the face of terrible violence from someone close to them. Continuing on to a slightly shorter excerpt that is particularly relevant as we talk about Turi's case today. The majority of domestic violence homicides in Washington state are committed with firearms. Since 1997, abusers used firearms to kill 54% of domestic violence homicide victims. Jesus. Yeah. Shifting back to our specific story, this was certainly true in the case of 66-year-old Turid Bentley. Oh, what's she... a cool name. Yeah. She's a really cool lady. Okay. I feel like you're going to break my heart. I'm literally about to immediately. Okay. <laughs> immediately. Yeah, no, this is abrupt. She was shot by her boyfriend on March 28th of 2007. Mm. So, you know, not too long before this report was released. Wow. That was before he turned the gun on a close friend who had often attempted to intervene in their tumultuous disagreements, followed by his own suicide with the weapon. Mm. Randall Nazawa would survive the attack. More on him to come, but Tori sadly would not. Mm. Now I'm sort of starting with the horrific conclusion for part two of this case series, as opposed to the gradual buildup in the story that we had with Kate. We already know that Kate's partner, John, was a monster at this point. So I certainly don't think as we continue that there's any need to mince words about that. But what I do want to do is tell you a lot more about Turi and about Randall as much as I possibly can. Okay. And spoiler alert, if you hadn't already guessed, based on the very heavy duty foreshadowing, Kate's worst fears were realized because the John that had terrorized her for years, culminating in her brutal assault on a holiday weekend in 1999, is the same John that attacked Turi and Randall a few years later in 2007. Shocking. (sighs) God. (sighs) How did he get, like, how did he get away? Well... What's interesting about John is that um, he had a number of fake IDs and fake fake passports. Um, He had several aliases. Um, He had actually, it seems like, some pretty wealthy and influential friends that uh, were all too happy but to basically blame the victim. They didn't believe Kate. Gross. Super gross. Obviously, she was totally wrong. Yeah. (sighs) All right. Starting at the beginning, Turi Lee Bentley was born January 28th, 1941, in Stavanger, Norway. Ooh, that's cool. Yes. She went by the nickname Turi. Her real, like, her legal name or her given name was Turid, which is so cute. I like that a lot. Yeah. (laughs) She was a longtime resident of Tacoma, specifically the Gig Harbor area. She was known by her children and grandchildren as Grandpa. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> which is literally the cutest thing ever. <sighs> Turi was a beautiful and loving Norwegian woman that bore a similar resemblance to Kate and actually had a similar demeanor, though <laughs> she was less worldly. She was exceedingly kind and self-assured, so we know that John clearly has a type. 
She worked for the Tacoma News Tribune in the early days of her previous marriage because she became... Oh. <laughs> because... <laughs> Before she became the office manager slash bookkeeper for her ex-husband's company. They had severed their union in a manner that was relatively civil. Turi also worked for a nutrition supplement company that John and Kate had been heavily involved in for a number of years. Hmm. Yeah, so some of that fraud stuff. I went a different way with this story, but Jesus Christ, <laughs> this man. He's just got his fingers in a little bit of everything that sucks. Ew. Get your yeah. fingers out of there. <laughs> Uh, I just kept thinking about all of the shitty MLMs that, you know, we're here. Mm. hearing all of the <laughs> fantastic stories about. <laughs> so what's weird about this, though, is that oddly enough, their paths never crossed during that period. Oh. Yeah. And it's not totally clear how she did uh, end up eventually connecting with John. Hmm. We do have an idea of the rough timeline, though. Turi met John when she was 61. She was a divorced and yet exceedingly happy woman with seemingly well-adjusted and successful adult children, as well as many fulfilling relationships outside of the romantic sphere, at least. In December of 2001, the FBI put John's wanted poster with detailed information about his previous aliases and work experience on their website. Around that same time, Turi was busy falling fast and hard for John because, of course, he had convincingly played the role of a kind-hearted man with similar goals and ideals. He seemed really good at that. Yeah, he was real good at, you know, pretending not to be a shitbag. Just not good at actually not being a shit. What bag. happened to fake it until you make it? Yeah. Wouldn't that like make you a good person? He was faking it. <laughs> In 2001, around Christmas time, John proposed to her. Though he suggested they needn't bother with the official paperwork, they could simply be satisfied with being married in their hearts. Oh. Yeah. This, of course, served as evidence to Turi that John was very genuine in his love for her. Because certainly someone that was only interested in her money would have been interested in her somewhat considerable estate. I would have been like, are you married and not telling me? <laughs> right? I know. It does kind of send up a flag, right? However, it's more likely that he didn't want to risk his um, anonymity mm -hmm. when he had managed to remain in hiding and also nearly completely out of public records for almost 15 years at this point. Holy shit. That's like, that's something that's I feel like you can't insane. do now. Uh, like yeah. Maybe you can. I don't know, but it, it would be harder. harder. The two were, air quotes, married in February. Of course, Turi and her family began to see warning signs and red flags almost immediately. Though there was only one time Turi had reticently shared her concerns that anyone could recall. Absolutely haunting in light of the violence they would later learn that John was capable of. Mm. It became clear it was John's intent to isolate her, and that he cared little for, and in fact was annoyed, by her strong faith and religious habits. Why would that be annoying? I don't know, because then she's got to leave the house to go to church, <sighs> and she's not... Spending that time, you know, taking care of or doting on him. God, barf guy. Yeah, so gross. She was a woman of faith and per her obit, mm. Turi loved nothing more than to share her passion for health with all who crossed her path. Her enthusiasm for life was compelling. She was a consistent churchgoer and she believed in the importance of helping others. It makes it, in my mind, particularly sad that Turi would be emotionally and financially, I told you we'd, we'd get there, uh, manipulated as well as verbally abused by John through the course of their relationship. Ugh. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I mean, I 
we say it all the time, we don't understand these people, but how can you do this to someone so nice and sweet? I know. Because they're the easiest to take advantage of. They are, because they want to believe the best in people, and they want to help people, and he just wants to get his dirty mitts on someone like that. Ugh. So... Now, I'm going to share a little bit more about Randall Nazawa. He was the only survivor of John's violent rampage on March 28th in 2007. Before that fateful day, he met John and Turi when he was age 46. He was already a retired dentist as a result of an injury from a car accident that left him blind in one eye. Hmm. Ouch. Yeah, some dumbass teenagers hopefully learned a lesson because this is a final destination level car accident. No, 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 no. You know the one no, where the log? No, no, I knew what you were going to say. I knew immediately what you were going to say. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know why that freaks me out so much. Yeah, I mean, I... I watch those movies too much, I think. Yep. <laughs> So remember how I said it was going to get a lot worse before it gets better? Oh, is this, did we reach the part? Mm, we're at the tip of the iceberg on the worst before it gets better. Do we just get the tip? <laughs> <laughs> Can we have just a tip, Caitlin? Just a tip. Okay. Sure. If just the tip is that a tree branch had actually lodged one of his eyes into his brain tissue... Oh, my God. You know, How did he live? I, I was shocked to learn that anyone could survive that type of injury, oh but Randall God. did. Literally the next sentence in my notes. This man is not meant to die. Oh, he's really not. <laughs> oh, my God. You're going to be like, what in the actual bionic man fuck? <laughs> <laughs> He recovered after what I'm sure I can only describe as a lengthy and complex surgery, but was no longer able to practice, and remember he was a dentist, yeah. due to the resulting visual impairment. Oh, All those times you hear people casually say, it's not brain surgery, but it was in this case. <laughs> It was brain surgery. It was literal brain and eyeball surgery. Gosh. Like, how do you even, where do you even, I, how do you, I know, I, I had to, (sighs) I had to stop trying to work it out because I can't. So he had only practiced for 11 years as a dentist before the accident forced his retirement. Oh, damn. I know. If you look on Amazon, there's a book that he wrote when he was younger It was like a dental, like, instruction textbook. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I found out a lot of cool stuff about him. Wow. And, you know, some other things. Of course you nerded out about the dentist. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> you know I did. <laughs> <laughs> Though he had always been a very healthy man prior to the accident, and actually remained so following the recovery, much in his life would be forever changed. Aside from his diminished vision and likely thanks to it, he could no longer drive. His family faced some difficult times after his accident. In fact, his marriage was under considerable strain when he first met John and Turi. He was living separately from his wife and daughters. Randall would become the face of John's latest entrepreneurial adventure. Major air quotes. Oh, no. Being able to find an alternative career helped him to remain positive and regain a sense of purpose and help John stay out of the limelight and maintain, you know, his hiding out in the wind <laughs> lifestyle of fuckery. Hiding out in the wind. Yep. As Randall began to understand John's true nature, he became increasingly alarmed by the unkind controlling and erratic behavior he exhibited towards others because that's super gross (laughs) indeed randall feared for turi's mental well-being and physical safety if only he had any indication of how quickly things would ultimately escalate and the harm that would befall that entire group 
Randall endured several hours of surgery following John's vicious attack and was fully blind as a result of being shot point blank. The bullet entering and ultimately costing him the loss of his remaining previously good eye. No shit. Some speculated, as I have myself, that John may have done this intentionally as an added insult to injury, though I doubt he anticipated that Randall would live if that's the case. Oh my god. The thing is, is if you shoot someone point blank in the back of the head, you might not understand like the trajectory of the bullet. He probably didn't assume that that was going to take out his other eye. No, if you did it from the back, you're not... No, that was not probably, on purpose. Probably not, but... But holy shit, though. Yeah. It couldn't hit the bad... Like, the already bad side? I know. This poor man. Yes. So, going back to Kate... She recalled shortly after the attack in Gig Harbor took place, having a nightmare about John where she experienced sleep paralysis. Oh. When the detective called to notify her of John's passing, she knew before he could even get the words out. Such an eerie experience for her, and poor Kate suffered such severe survivor's guilt. Oh, my gosh. She fought for literal years to do anything and everything that she could to yeah. make sure that this guy couldn't do this to someone else. And she just – there was nothing more that she could have done. It's – No. She it, did everything. I mean, besides putting her own life at risk again, like maybe baiting him yeah. out or something, which yeah. – no, don't do that. Well, she considered it. <laughs> Did she? Yeah. Oh, goodness. I'm glad she didn't, though. Like, I mean, because yeah. who's to say if it would have worked? I mean, he could have you, yeah, you killed just her and gone on to kill more people. Like, exactly. Yeah, you just don't know. Yeah. So at least she would no longer have to wonder if one day John might finally catch up to her. But she wasn't easily convinced of that fact. <laughs> When she asked to see photos of John's body so she could confirm with certainty that he was truly gone and no longer a threat, the detective worked to convince her that it would be too upsetting and instead offered that his identity had been confirmed with fingerprints, finally offering her the first bit of closure. Wow. I can't even... <sighs> It's really terrible. We've got another promo roll that we are really excited to share today. I'm Whitney. And I'm Melissa. We are podcast addicts. Fascinated with true crime. Winos. Boy moms. And both live in Texas. We became best friends almost instantly. When we discovered our obsession with true crime, Pinot Grigio, and all things macabre. We decided to bring our love of wine and podcasts to you. Join us on our weekly adventures as we branch out on new wines and cover crimes from across the nation. We will discuss everything from cults to kidnappings to murders and all that fall in between. Pop a cork or grab a glass. This is Colts, Crimes, and Cabernet. Hi, I'm Jamie. And I'm Mel. And we are the hosts of Murderotica, a podcast about murder. And sometimes ghosts. And lots of poorly, and sometimes well-written, erotica. Murder and sex together? That's a bit grim, Jamie. Oh my god, no. But yes. But very separately. Imagine your favorite true crime podcast meets a podcast where someone's fatherly figure writes a sexy series of books. No one's thought of that yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me after listening about someone losing their head with one click of a button, I can hear about someone getting it back again? Yes, but sexually. Head? Get it? 
It's basically like we have our very own built-in palate cleanser, so now you don't need to rewatch The Office for the 477th time to get all that murder out of your brain before bed. Listen in to every True Crime Tuesday and Thirsty Thursday on your favorite podcasting platform. Spotify, Apple, whatever. And check out our description in each episode for the links to all of our socials. Here's wishing you much more foreplay and much less foul play. Goodbye. You guys, we're back. Kate hoped that she might be able to speak to Randall, but his injuries, the ensuing pneumonia and other infections, as well as multiple surgeries, made that impossible for the foreseeable future. Mm. Aside from losing his other eye, Randall's tongue had been bisected by the bullet. Wow. So, which, uh, just in case some of you guys are, like, not clear on that terminology. I'm raising okay, my I hand. Like, I was going to ask was, you. Okay. <laughs> so, bisected is, like, what you would picture when you look at, like, a snake's tongue mm-hmm. where it's, like, okay. forked. That's so what I it thought. Split it split Yeah. People get that done on purpose. People do. That's um, crazy. Yeah. Randall did definitely not No, 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 no. Um, his jaw was also broken oh, and he lost gosh. three teeth. So for somebody who was a dentist for over a decade in a prior period of his life, I can't even imagine how awful. It's just... Mm. Which teeth did he lose? I'm not sure. You didn't look that up? Uh, well, <laughs> there's a lot of information about Dr. Uh, Randall, but uh, that's not something I was able to find. Disappointed in you, Caitlin? I know. Well, trust, I, I, I looked, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know I wanted to know which teeth. Unfortunately, the one thing his injuries hadn't robbed him of was his memory of the attack. Mm. He could still clearly visualize John threatening them with a gun. When Turi belittled John, even as she was on bended knee, Randall could recall how uncomfortable he was, though not necessarily that he was fearful yet. Certainly, he didn't want to believe that John could ever harm her. It was when Turi said, Tell him what happened in Oregon. Tell him what you did to her. That Randall heard John fire as Turi fell to the floor, seemingly at least instantly dead. Randall stayed motionless, I mean, as motionless as possible in that situation, except to reach for Turi's foot, only to realize he couldn't find her pulse. <sighs> but he couldn't avoid John's wrath like he hoped. Mm. Randall said he didn't hear a very loud noise. His ears simply rang. He didn't feel pain in that moment. This was a comfort as his vision went black. Oh, no. He felt it surely meant that Turi hadn't suffered. He couldn't see, but he slid underneath a nearby table He played dead until he heard another shot. Because he was blind, he couldn't be totally sure what had happened. But it was shortly after that that he got up. He found his way to a bedroom in the home where he lost consciousness for multiple hours. Wow. He found his way to a phone upon waking up. But he wasn't able to make a call for help to 911 because he's blind. I can't imagine how terrifying that would have been to know that you desperately need medical attention after surviving this experience, but be unable to do anything to procure the medical aid that you need. Yeah, and you can't even, like, find your way out to go. Like, you don't know where you're going. You don't know where you're at. Like, yeah. Wow. He had no idea what time it was, how much time had passed, but he was determined. He was able to find his way out of the home where a passerby on the street outside thankfully noticed him immediately horrified, and that individual was able to alert authorities. 
Wow. Though we led with the fact that Randall did live, his survival was anything but a foregone conclusion. It would be unclear whether he would make any level of recovery for weeks. Despite this traumatic experience and prolonged recovery, Randall had been able to find purpose in life by continuing to teach yoga and other fitness classes. Oh, I love that. He endured so much, but he is the embodiment of the resilience of the human spirit. Seriously. A friend said during his stay in the hospital, he earned the nickname, the bounce back blind guy. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. Okay, I'm going to break your heart again. No, stop. I don't want any more. I know. Well, this I had to do. I fell down a rabbit hole. Okay. Um, <laughs> I hope that uh, I'm not on a QAnon watch list now. Holy shit. <laughs> there's, there's some stuff. Um, this obviously happened well after the book by Anne Rule was released. Um, Dr. Randall Nazawa sadly passed away on June 27th, 2021, due to complications from COVID. Oh, wow. Guys, like, <laughs> lost both of his eyes and just was maimed horrifically in this car accident and, you know, I mean, nearly murdered and fucking COVID. In June of 2021, mm -hmm. when if everyone should have just worn their masks and got vaccinated. <laughs> yeah, well, all right. I mean, I don't like it, but. That just sucks. Dude. I got to tell you some more about Dr. Randall. Okay. I'm listening. His extended network of friends and colleagues have varying thoughts and feelings about COVID, as well as many aspects of medicine that I and probably almost anyone listening uh, don't necessarily agree with. Some of them alleging that the hospital's COVID protocol and the medical interventions designed to save him were, in fact, no less than murder. Okay. What I do wholeheartedly agree with is that this is a very sad loss, and I do hope that those closest to him have a measure of peace despite their mourning. I do also hope they stop saying that hospital staff murdered Dr. Randall. That would also be good. Why would th like? Why did they think he was murdered? They don't actually think he was murdered. Well, they like just are alternative medicine on a very different end of the scale. Oh, are they the type to like no medicine at all unless it's like from home? No, they. I mean, they believe in a certain amount of medical intervention. Okay, but they're just like. They're kind of the Jenny McCarthy side of the spectrum. Okay. You know, like <laughs> vaccines give you stuff that has been disproven. Oh, yeah. I just can't. It's very <laughs> problematic. I can't even oh, go no. there. I mean, but it's how not, sad that he died. Of that COVID. is very sad. Like, seriously, like the universe just tried repeatedly to kill this dude and like nothing could take him out. And fucking COVID. COVID got him. Like, it got a lot of people. God, fucking get vaccinated. Please, and thank you. We would like to go back to, to doing life things the way we used to do them. Or, you know, something close. You know, yeah, adjacent <laughs> to that. Turi and Randall would become almost inextricably linked in both life and in death. In part because they formed a bond as they worked with John on... His business venture. Major air quotes again. <laughs> then also in a far darker way as a result of the manipulation and abuse they endured at the hands of John. And finally by the tragedy that was thrust upon both of them by his final act of heinous violence. Also taken from Turi's obit is this 
touching summary regarding her family and their wishes after her passing. Turi was survived by her mother, Liv Lee, known as Mormor. Oh, they're so cute. I know. <laughs> her sister, Bodil Berg, who lived in Salem, Oregon, mm. as well as her three children, David Bentley, Susan Hoskinson, and Sonia Olson, 10 grandchildren. Wow. Are you going to name them all? No, I'm just kidding. No, there's so many of them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and one great-grandchild. Oh. In lieu of flowers, her family asked that donations be made to a trust that was set up at Columbia Bank for Randall Nasawa. Oh, that is so sweet. <sighs> I know. I was like, wow. This is so oh. weird. My eyes are leaking. Stop. <laughs> the following information comes from the King County Domestic Violence Prevention Resources Online. The source is listed as the Bureau of Justice Statistics dated 2010. Every year, approximately 1.3 million women and 835,000 men are physically assaulted by an intimate partner in the United States. Many of these cases are never reported to the police. In 2007, particularly relevant year, <laughs> in 2007, intimate partners committed 14% of all homicides in the U.S. Wow. The total estimated number of intimate partner homicide victims in 2007 was 2,340 including 1,640 female victims and 700 men. Turi was a woman who was truly overwhelmingly loved, and her family's grace in the face of such a horrible tragedy. Um, I don't know, I has my eyes doing this weirdly thing. <laughs> to conclude... I want to share with you another excerpt taken from that same report by the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And we're going to put some stuff in the show notes. Okay. I did a lot of research. <laughs> I think my show notes took me almost as long as oh the notes gosh. for this episode. <laughs> <sighs> to know is not enough. We will end the violence not just by understanding the experiences of victims, but by letting that understanding transform our work and our lives. When our knowledge is met with compassion for victims' lives and a powerful sense of our collective responsibility, we can transform the conditions that allow abuse to thrive. We no longer wonder whether people close to us are affected by domestic violence. We know that they are. Now that we know, how will our work be different? What will this workplace, this neighborhood, this clinic look like now that we know there are people here every day who are being terrorized in their homes? Now that we know someone we care about is hurting someone they love? Now that we know that each interaction we have today may be with a person struggling to survive, break free, or remain whole. Now that we know, how will we make our knowing matter? Wow. That was beautiful. Guys, how are we going to do it? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have, I think, a couple of um, screenshots from some of the websites that I went to. Um, I want to show you this because we've already talked about... Um, our tarot card, but um, I thought this was a really interesting thing that a lot of these websites do. Um, and I just want to tell everybody kind of what this looks like. So I want to get um, kind of your reaction. So I'm going okay. to, I'm going to go to our link. Okay. So I've got screenshots of these, but this is the hotline.org. And they have some helpful, tips for online safety that pop up. 
So you can probably, I'll turn this for you so you can see it. I had no oh, idea. Oh, wow. So they're giving you tips on how to like delete your browser history? Is that yeah. like, oh, okay. And Chris was like, wait, why does it do that? He's like, are you looking at porn? <laughs> <laughs> so the pop-up um, that we're looking mm. at um, on this one, and there's several different versions that are out there on um, some of these resource websites. It says, leave this site safely. You can quickly leave this website by clicking the X in the top right or by pressing the escape key twice. To browse this site safely, be sure to regularly clear your browser history. And so you really, like, you kind of have to acknowledge these pop-ups usually to be able to, like, kind of navigate yeah. the site. So we were like, oh, this is weird. Like, do other websites do this? Or is this something you can do with, like, any web page? It's a feature that they have specifically built into their, like, web domain, their website. Oh. So <laughs> I had to try it. I was like, I have yeah. to see this in action. So if you hit escape twice, it's gone. And nice. it goes to the main page of Google because that's my, you know, main browser. And so it doesn't somebody... do that on, like, other websites? or mm -mm. Oh, that's cool. No, I tried it with a couple of other ones, like – um I don't think it does it on Facebook. Let's try it. So you hit escape twice on oh, Facebook, okay. a number of other websites. It it doesn't do that, but it's a unique feature that's built into yeah. these because... Because that's sometimes quicker than trying to like... It's a serious safety concern for people if they're trying to like, you know, look up these resources in, you know, maybe just a few minutes yeah. that they're left alone to like be able to do that. So. And yeah, and then that's a good one is clearing your browser history or maybe browsing incognito or like maybe don't browse on your Wi-Fi because you can look it up that way as well. Yeah, um, I do have a number of they they do have um, some different safety tips and things that nice. were included on the various resources. So um, I have some information for um, national level resources so in literally anyone in the united states can use these resources um so we've got um some specific to domestic abuse we have some specific to um helping victims of sexual assault um and i do have state specific for both oregon and washington um I'm familiar with this system already, a story for a different day, um, the Vine system. And Oregon is um, one of the states that, like, really tries to make this program easy to use. Um, but a lot of states have notifications through Vine. And if you're not familiar with it, um, Vine is victim information and notification every day. Um, so this is basically a resource that you can sign up for so that if someone is a person that is potentially, you know, uh, dangerous to you, you can ask for certain updates related to their um, offender profile, oh. if you will. So anyone can call the service um, to ask for the current status of an offender, to register to receive immediate notification if an offender is released, transferred, escapes, or dies. Wow. Um, you can also ask about any other important probation and parole information. Um, it's available 24 hours a day, 365 days a year here in Oregon. It's available in English and Spanish. And a live operator is also available. Vine can also call a phone number automatically to notify when that offender is released or has a change in parole or probation status. So um, I'm going to put the resource for um, Vine in particular because it's a really important um, resource for That's people. very helpful. Yeah. And um, just know that I've, I've included it because it's really easy to find for the state of Oregon. Um, and I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm familiar with how that system works. I already have access to it. So um, you can use it in just about any state. 
Oh, I, cool. I believe you can use it in literally any state. So it's a good resource. You can always um, just search for your state specific because they do have different portals. Oh, okay. I've used it for Oregon, um, Alaska. Mm. So lots of good resources and information. And, um, you know, if you have a protection order or something like that, this is a really easy way for you to figure out um, – what information you need and kind of how to take next steps to protect yourself um, when there's already a, a criminal offense on file. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's really awesome that they have. Uh, I didn't, I've never heard of anything like that. So yeah. that's nice to know. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's great because it actually, um, whether it's an offender who's in the custody of actual Oregon Department of Corrections or even the Oregon um, Youth Authority or a county jail, um, it has basically all of that information. So it's it's a really great resource for, you know, it's victim information and notification. Yeah. Keep yourself so, safe. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you, Kaylin. That was like <laughs> that was super hard, intense, <laughs> but necessary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this one was uh, it was it was tough because there's so much about John. Like, we really could have made this like three parts, and we could have talked more about um all of his like financial fraud and like the medical malpractice and yeah, um, all of that. But I just felt like the the overwhelming message um, from this story is, you know, this type of abuse is, you know, something that we have to really, <laughs> we got to, we got to work on this guys. <laughs> I know. Like the statistics were just crazy, especially with the gun violence, like the 54%. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's in a, that's in a neighboring state. That's, you know, statistics that were compiled, you know, less than a year after Turi uh, was murdered Gosh. in the state where she was murdered. And um, yeah, it's the impact of that, you know, when you're reading about a case like this and you see that and it's very, those numbers are very black and white. <laughs> I don't so. know how you can look at someone like that and still like, I mean, I get protecting gun rights, but like, how do you look at these things and not see that something needs to change? Yeah. Like yeah. something obviously needs to change. I'm not saying that we need to take your guns. I like guns too. Okay. But I'm just saying. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I don't know. This one really, uh, <laughs> it took me a long time to put this together, but, um, it it just felt like it was really worth it because um, I was able to find so much in terms of I had to I had to really pare down on on all of the yeah on all of the websites and resources and stuff. So I've really tried to find like like if you go to our show notes for this second part of the case, um, it'll have, you know, something that can help you if this is, if this is, um, if this is what you need to find today. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's weird. I kind of <laughs> like want to pull another tarot card. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, cause I'm thinking about all, like the first part was so different. I mean, not uh, like we we're talking about John mm -hmm. and like that card related to him but i almost wonder if like there's another card in here that will relate to the like domestic abuse or something along those lines yeah i feel like the first one you can kind of see like how it relates to it yeah in a way it's like you know like i said that we get the build up with kate and it's kind of a slow progression where Obviously, we go a different way in this second half. And um, I mean, at least John's not here to keep doing this. But it's this is such a frustrating case because of how there were so many people that actually tried to defend him. And people that, you know, even after she's literally been battered, that 
you know, didn't do what they should have done to try to help and support and protect Kate. I got the Empress. Mm. All right. Let's see. She looks like a badass bitch on a throne of cushions, and she's sitting with a heart with the <laughs> what's this like the female symbol with the, yeah. the circle with the cross on the bottom. Yeah, I don't know what it's called. I, I don't know. I can't think of what I. I feel like I should know that. But. She has like lemons on the bottom of her dress or something. <laughs> Cute. It looks like there's like icy rock shards around her. Okay. Well, obviously this one's for Turi. It does it relate? Well, I don't know. I'll read it and you can tell me. Okay. Creativity, feminine power, mature women, fertility, pleasure. Those are the key words. Okay, so for the actual visual on the card, it says she's u- she's usually shown as a mature female figure, sometimes seated on a throne, sometimes in nature, surrounded by flowers and vegetation, indicating fruitfulness. The Empress is linked to Venus, the goddess of love, beauty, and pleasure. Okay, upright. The empress represents strong feminine energy and may describe a mother fi- figure Aww. or a mature artistic creative person. Whether she rules the home or a business, she represents female authority. A card of fertility, she signifies abundance of all kinds and shows your capacity for nurturing, caring, and supporting others as well as yourself. Sometimes this card refers to your own mother. Well, and then it goes on to say in a man's reading. Well, this ain't a man's reading, so. (laughs) Let me, what does it say for the man's reading? It says in a man's reading, the empress may encourage him to recognize the feminine component in himself. Okay. I think it's just the overall representation Aww. of we're badass bitches. I just feel <laughs> like it's very like it's very telling, you know, like this is someone who was obviously <sighs> Okay, I should have just read the whole description of oh, the gosh. of the picture. <laughs> Oh, my God. The Empress symbolizes feminine power in the material world, in contrast to the High Priestess, who represents feminine spiritual power. A card of beauty and creativity, the Empress is depicted as the universal mother who governs procreation, nurturing, the security and comforts of home, and domestic harmony. Oh. Wow, the fact that it, like, has the word domestic in it, too, and we're, like, talking about domestic violence and, like, wow. I just, I just feel like it's, I don't know, I just feel like I I immediately just pick up the energy of this is, you know, this is, this is Turi. Yeah. Specifically, you know, she obviously was a very... She was a very nurturing, a very loving, a very spiritual woman and, you know, a mother, a grandmother, a great grandmother. Yeah. But the part that gets me is it says whether she rules the home or a business, she represents female authority. And I just, I feel like it sticks with me that in her last moment, it was like, I'm not letting you, like, snake your way out of this. She said. (laughs) Yeah, what did she say? I meant to, like, I was so um, overwhelmed in the moment when you were reading it, and I meant to, like, go back and. Yeah. So she knew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she she (sighs) found out about Kate. It was when Turi said, tell him what happened in Oregon. Tell him what you did to her. And he couldn't he couldn't handle it. No, he couldn't handle it. She was way too strong for him. So maybe in a man's reading, the Empress may encourage him to recognize the feminine component in himself. Oh, John. 
It's interesting, too, because this card has, like, all of these, like, ice shards around it almost. And it yeah. just reminds, it just, like, makes me think of, like, there's so much pain and things that happen. And, like, she's still just sitting there, like, I'm in charge. And amongst all of these ice shards. That's, I'm kind of blown away yeah. by that. And there's a number three on it. And he had, like, we talked about three people that he had, like, victimized. God. Yeah, that's true. Guys, I'm a witch. Just saying. <laughs> oh, my God. I was just, like, looking it's at the so deck, and I was like, I think we need to pull a card. Like, I f- just feel like we need to we do not, it. We don't ever do <laughs> no, that. No, we don't. And I we didn't do a video of it because I just, it was a spur of the moment oh, decision. It's- yeah, that that weirds me out. Ugh, but that's it. That's all she wrote. That's all you get from this. I can't talk about John anymore. I refuse to. <laughs> We're throwing him in the trash along with this Chardonnay. Yes. <laughs> Jesus. Maybe it should be John motherfucking Chardonnay. John Brandon. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> John Chardonnay fuck not Brandon. <laughs> now we're just getting silly. Yeah. Speaking of Chardonnay, we need some more rose. Mm-hmm. We okay. Do. Well, should we say goodbye to all the creepy people? Yeah. Okay. Bye, creepy people. Bye, creepy people. Have, Have a creepy ass day. day. See, See you next, next Tuesday. Tuesday. Not you, John. Fuck off. (laughs) So for all of you that are listening, if you have any true crime or paranormal stories that you want us to share, maybe with the whole Pacific Northwest. Yes, we would love (laughs) to read them on the pod. Yes, we will read them out loud. (laughs) Not just in our heads. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) They don't have to be from the Pacific Northwest if you would like to share. Email us at PNW Haunts and Homicides at gmail.com. It's all spelled out, no special characters. Super duper easy peasy. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Same thing as the email at PNW Haunts and Homicides, all spelled out, no special characters. Please also rate and review us on whatever platform you're listening to and check out our stories on social media because our meme game is hot. (laughs) Agreed. And if you agree, like Caitlin, you can also find us on Patreon and support the show. Bitchin. As Randall began to understand John's true nature, he became... I forgot how to speak while we were on break. It's okay. You never knew how. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it's so true. I know. Do you do you ever, like, l- like, listen to what I've written and go, how can you, like... You're, like, pretty well spoke. At, well, you're pretty well written. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... I, I can't speak either. It's okay. <laughs> Oh jeez. I think I'm worse than you are. Oh, my gosh. I feel like I... Well, anyway, shall we? 